On behalf of The Nation Magazine, Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada Action Fund, and the Fair Immigration Reform Movement, I want to thank Senator Sanders and every member of the firm network and all our guests for joining us here today. Our partner in this event is The Nation, America's oldest weekly magazine, which has been celebrating its 150th birthday throughout 2015. Forged in the crucible of emancipation, The Nation was started by a group of young abolitionists in 1865 committed to reporting on and participating in this country's struggles to live up to its founding creed, to create a more perfect union by extending the guarantees of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to Americans of all races. So they've been in the racial justice business for a long time, and we are proud that they are joining us here today. I am an organizer at the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada Action Fund, and we work every single day to make the voices of immigrant families heard throughout our state of Nevada and our country. But I would not be here today, and this event would not be taking place if it weren't for the courageous acts of immigrants throughout our country that stand every single day in the public eye, risk everything, and say, I am here, I am not afraid, and I demand to be treated with dignity and respect. Yeah. With immigrants that say, my family invests in America, America should invest in my family. And that's exactly what today is about. It's about the power of those voices coming together to not only have conversations with these candidates, but to continue fighting for our communities. So with that, I would like to invite everybody to join us tomorrow morning at that strike because Las Vegas needs you. And with that, I want to go ahead and welcome all of you for being here. So muchas gracias, and la lucha sigue. My name is Kika Matos, and I am the Director of Immigrant Rights and Racial Justice at the Center for Community Change. I'm going to be one of your moderators today, along with my friend and colleague, Dorian Warren, this handsome Good man. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Dorian is a renowned scholar on issues of economic justice and race and a whole lot more. And if he looks familiar to uh, many of you in this room, it is because he's also a um, uh, host and executive producer on MSNBC, and his, uh, he has his own show. It's called Nerding Out. So thank you, Dorian. One of the most um, exciting but also heaviest responsibilities in my job is uh, the privilege to serve as a spokesperson for the Fair Immigration Reform Movement. Um, for those of you who are new to the movement, FIRM started about 15 years ago. It began at a time when if we, if we so much as mentioned the idea of citizenship for immigrants in the halls of power in America, we would get laughed out of the room. But that, I'm happy to say, doesn't happen anymore. And the reason that doesn't happen anymore is because together, brick by brick, we have built a movement. When we stood together in courage, we found out we had friends. We found out we had friends in the civil rights movement, friends in the labor movement, friends in the business community, and friends in communities of faith all across America. But make no mistake, it is thanks to the work of FIRM that there is now such a thing as America as the pro-immigrant vote. And it is thanks to the pro-immigrant voters in America that there is now no pathway to the White House without the support of who? Our families. This movement, our movement, has fundamentally changed the conversation in America about immigrants by putting immigrant families front and center of the conversation. And let me ask you something, are we done yet? No. 
I didn't hear that. Are we done yet? No. No, we are not done yet. And today is another step in changing that conversation. Our format is simple. I'll shortly ask our friend Lawrence Benito of the Illinois Immigrant Action to introduce Senator Bernie Sanders. Senator Sanders will then have 10 minutes to lay out his vision for immigrants in America. Then Dorian and I will introduce the unique set of people who will share stories and ask questions of the senator. The senator will have a total of five minutes on each subject, which includes time for any follow-up at the discretion of Dorian or me. So let's get started. And here to introduce Senator Sanders is my brother and warrior from Illinois. Let's give it up for Lawrence Benito. Thank you, Kika. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Lawrence Benito, Executive Director, ICER Action. Anyone from Illinois in the house? It's my privilege to welcome and introduce Senator Bernie Sanders today. Millions of Americans are struggling today to make ends meet. They struggle and scrap and fight to put food on the table for their families. They pray for good health because they're one medical bill away or one missed workday from going under, from losing even the crappy job that keeps the rent paid most months. This is happening while most of the well-off are getting richer and more powerful. Senator Sanders has done more than anyone in America to put the issue of inequality at the center of the debate in American politics. And truthfully, as a guy from Chicago, I appreciate the way that he's been speaking truth to power and going after the influence of big money. We in this room are immigrants or the children of immigrants, people who came to America, like many generations before us, to build a better life for our families. And we come from communities and neighborhoods where you have a better chance of being pulled over by racial profiling than finding a good job with benefits, where dirty air gives our kids asthma, where rigged rules strip our communities of wealth. As immigrants, we live firsthand the inequality that Senator Sanders is talking about. And as a movement, as community organizers, we know Bertie is right when he, when he says it's going to take organized people to beat organized money. And so, my brothers and sisters, please join me today in welcoming Senator Bernie Sanders to the stage. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Lawrence, thank you very much for the introduction and thank all of you for being here today. Uh, let me um, divide my remarks up into a couple of parts. Uh, let me start off by telling you a little bit about Bernie Sanders. You know, about six months ago when we began this venture to try to become president of the United States, not a whole lot of people knew who I was. So let me tell you a little bit about me. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Anyone ever hear of Brooklyn, New York? All right. Uh, and my dad was an immigrant. So when we talk about the immigrant experience, I know a little bit about that. Uh, my father came to this country at the age of 17 from Poland, not speaking English without a nickel in his pocket. And he never made much money. We lived in a three and a half room rent controlled apartment. But he was the proudest American that you could know because he was able to raise his kids, his two sons in a way that never would have been the case given the prejudice and the lack of money uh, from the country that he came in. Now what I have been trying to do in this campaign is to say to the American people, this is not just voting for a president. Yes, <clears throat> I do want you to vote for Bernie Sanders for president, but it is a lot more than that. That's what Lawrence was just talking about. We are living in a country today which has a rigged economy. And that means that millions of people, Latinos and African Americans and Asian Americans and whites, are working longer hours for lower wages while almost all of the new wealth and income is going to the top 1%. What this campaign is about is ending 
the disgrace that we have the most unequal distribution of wealth and income where the top one-tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. This economy is about creating, this campaign is about creating an economy that works for working families, not just billionaires. And the only way, <coughs> the only way we do that is when we come together, is when Latinos, African Americans, whites come together to create a political movement that government should work for all of us, not just the people on top. And then you got another issue. Not only is the economy rigged, our campaign finance system is corrupt, underlying corrupt, as a result of Citizens United and the establishment of super PACs. I'm the only Democratic candidate for president who does not have a super PAC, does not want a super PAC, because I don't want money from corporate America or from the billionaires because I don't support their agenda. Don't want their money, don't need their money. And the way we have raised money is that at this point in the campaign, we have received more individual contributions, over 750,000, than any candidate in the history of the United States of America at this point in a campaign, averaging all of 30 bucks a contribution. I'm proud of that. This is a grassroots movement trying to bring people together to make sure that our government works for all of us. That's kind of what the campaign is about. Let me say a few words on immigration. Let me congratulate uh, all of the people who are here, the people in firm, uh, for the work that they have done for so, so many years. So very briefly, let me talk about what immigration reform means to me. But before I even do that, let me say this. In America, there are people who have differences of opinion on immigration reform. That's called democracy. I respect that. But what I do not respect are people like Donald Trump who are appealing to racism and xenophobia to win votes. That is unacceptable. We have come too far as a nation, and we have struggled too much as a nation to overcome racism, to allow candidates for president of the United States talk about people from Mexico as rapists or criminals. Not acceptable, and we will fight that tooth and nail. Now, in terms of uh, some of the ideas that I bring to this campaign in terms of immigration reform, obviously uh, it goes without saying uh, that this country needs comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, the Senate, as you know, three years ago passed legislation, not great legislation, uh, but it was a step forward. Unfortunately, my colleagues in the House refer to demagogue on the issue of immigration rather than pass serious immigration reform. So first thing and most importantly, our goal has got to be to rally the American people to understand the importance of comprehensive immigration reform, providing legal status to the 11 million people today who are living in the shadows and moving toward a path toward citizenship. And I will do my best as President of the United States to rally the American people so that both bodies, House and Senate, pass strongest comprehensive immigration reform possible. Second of all, to the degree that Congress is unable to act, it is clear to me that the President of the United States has got to use the powers uh, that are in his uh, province. And that means that I will expand President Obama's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the DACA program, to provide broad administrative relief to the parents of citizens, 
the parents of legal permanent residents, the parents of dreamers, other family members, and the rest of the immigrant population that would have been legalized if the House of Representatives did their job. The growth of the immigrant detention deportation machine and the expansion of border militarization has perpetuated unjust policies and resulted in the separation of hundreds of thousands of immigrant families. The bottom line for me, and I think frankly for most Americans, although people do disagree, the goal is to bring families together, not to separate them. I mean, last night I heard an extreme example, extreme example of what this separation is about. I talked to a young man who put his life on the line to serve our country in the military. And while he was in the military, his wife and child were deported. Can anyone imagine that? I talked to kids, young people, in Phoenix, Arizona, tears streaming down their eyes, scared to death that their parents would be deported. Every day, wake up and carry that fear with them. That has got to change. Our job is to unite families, not to divide families. <laughs> Further, I will direct immigration officers to immediately stop initiating deportations against those eligible for relief. This would include dismantling inhumane deportation programs and private detention centers. And let me say a word on that. You may or may not know that several months ago I introduced legislation which takes private companies out of the business of running deportation centers and running jails. Companies should not be making profits to the, by incarcerating people in this country. Further, in my view, criminalizing an undocumented parent for reentering the country after being separated from his or her child, not having a driver's license, or having a forged document should not be an excuse to deny a pathway to citizenship. <laughs> Further, I will direct my administration to extend humane treatment and asylum to victims of domestic violence and unaccompanied minors coming from Latin America and elsewhere as a distinct group of people fleeing persecution. This is the just and moral thing to do. Further, the current immigration system, as is the case in so many other areas, discriminates against women, and that has got to stop. Women are often the breadwinners of families, but our current immigration policies, in too many cases, treats them as mere dependents. That will change when I'm elected president. Bottom line is that we cannot and must not sweep up millions of men, women, and children, many of whom have been here for years, and throw them out of the country. That is not, that may be a value of some right-wing Republicans. That is not an American value. America has always been, for my family and for your families, a haven for the oppressed. We cannot and must not shirk the historic role of the United States as a protector of vulnerable people fleeing persecution. These are just some of the key elements 
of uh, immigration policy that I will be fighting for. But let me end uh, my remarks before I take questions and comments by reiterating maybe the most important point that I want to make. These are enormously pivotal and difficult times for our country. Establishment politics and establishment economics is not going to do it. If we are going to transform America, if we are going to understand that this country today is the wealthiest country in the history of the world, and that if we stand together as Latinos, as immigrants, as African Americans, as whites, as Asian Americans, that when we stand together, no matter how much money and how much power the billionaire class has, that when we stand together, there is nothing that we cannot accomplish in creating the kind of life our people deserve. And that means, that means, brothers and sisters, not only strong immigration reform, it means health care to all people as a right. It means raising the minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. It means making public colleges and universities tuition free and paying for that through a tax on Wall Street speculation. So thank you very much uh, for hearing me out, and uh, let's go forward together. Thank you. Right here. Thank you, Senator Sanders. And just a reminder, we're now going to move to the question part of the agenda. Good. And so uh, we'll have, for each of this, each section here, we'll have one of our fine people here on stage to ans ask you a question. Great. Kika and I will follow up. Uh, we have five minutes each for each of these questions in this section. So first up is Julianne Hing from The Nation magazine. Give Julianne some love, y'all. Yeah. Thanks, Dorian. Hi, Senator Sanders. You've laid out some really visionary ideas on immigration, um, but you know, if elected president, you'll likely be up against a Congress which has, which is easily scared off immigration reform, um, and and even President Obama's latest executive action is tied up in the courts right now. I'm wondering, how do you plan to make lasting immigration change that can't be undone by some future administration? Okay, great. Great question. I think that the only way we make real change in America is when millions of people, many of whom have already given up on the political process. We have one of the lowest voter turnouts of any major country on earth. And the people on top like that idea because they want to see a system where nobody votes, where very few people vote, and big money buys elections. That's their idea of democracy. My idea is the very opposite, to do away with Citizens United and substantially increase voter turnout, making it easier, not harder, for people to vote. So I think what we have got to do is lay on the line and tell every American, not just the Latino community, why immigration reform is important to this nation, that we're all in it together. Very briefly, in 2007, I went to a town called Immokalee, Florida. Anybody know what's important about Immokalee, Florida? Tomatoes. That's right, it's tomatoes. I went there in 2007 because I knew that undocumented workers were being exploited in the most ruthless manner possible. Literally, in some cases, held in virtual slavery. When you have people who have no legal protection, who can be exploited, it is not only unfair and inhumane to those workers, what does it mean for every worker in America? If I can pay you four bucks an hour because you have no legal protection, I don't have to pay him a living wage. So when we give legal rights to undocumented workers, what we are doing is standing up for every worker in America in our effort to rebuild the American middle class. And all people have got to know that. 
So my answer essentially is building a political movement. We need, you got white workers, you got black workers out there who are struggling for 10, 11 bucks an hour. We need the help of the immigrant community to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. We have got to stand together. Youth unemployment in America. You know what youth unemployment is for Hispanic kids? And underemployment, 36%. African American kids, 51%. No one group can do it alone. We need to come together. So that's my message, that every American has got to stand together to fight for an economy that works for all of us and not just Donald Trump and his billionaire friends. Senator, just want to uh, ask a follow-up question from Julianne's um, question around comprehensive immigration reform. I think most of us in this room would agree that we have a pretty toxic Congress, and we have for o over a decade now tried to pass comprehensive immigration reform. So my question to you is, as president, what would you do specifically to work with such a dysfunctional Congress? to make sure that we pass a comprehensive immigration reform bill that includes a path to citizenship and is it full with toxic provisions around border mil militarization and the likes? That's right. And let me repeat what I said a moment ago. You know, I voted for the uh, 2013 bill. It was not a great bill. We know that. It was better than nothing, I thought. Um, I will tell you two things, and I don't want to mislead you here. I do have a history of being able to work with Republicans. In the last uh, Congress, um, I was chairman of the Veterans Committee. We passed uh, probably the most comprehensive veterans health care legislation in decades, and I had to do that working with people like John McCain, people like Jeff Miller over in the House. I can work with Republicans, but I got to be honest with you. So long as Republicans think that they gain politically by demonizing the immigrant community, and by appealing to racism, we're not going to win this struggle. And that's getting back to Julianne's point. Our job is to bring people together to say to white working class people, you know what? It's not the immigrants who are your opponents. It's not the immigrants who have sent you a job abroad. It's not the immigrants who are refusing to raise the minimum wage. These are the people who are doing it. And you've got to stand together. And when we do that, I think immigration reform can be one of the very important fundamental changes that we make in America to transform this country and improve lives for all of our people. But it is a question of creating a movement. I have said it and I'll repeat it again. This election is not just electing Bernie Sanders president or Hillary Clinton or anybody else president. Nothing significant is going to happen unless we build a movement if 63% of the American people don't vote, as was the case last November, we are not going to make the changes that we need. So we need leadership, we need vision, we need people prepared to take on the greed of Wall Street and the billionaire class. That is what this campaign is attempting to do. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Ivania Castillo from Virginia. Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm a voter from Virginia. I'm a volunteer in Casa in Action, and I represent more than 80,000 members from Maryland, Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Pennsylvania. I'm from El Salvador. I came to the United States in 1980 with my mom and my three sisters. My mom got kidnapped in El Salvador, so she brought us to this country to save our life and to have a better future. In 1986, I became resident of this country. In, 1980, in 1997, I became a citizen of the United States. I worked very hard like any immigrant in this country. I went to school during the daytime and I worked, my first job that I had in the United States was working in a construction company, breaking floor from the kitchen, kitchen floor and I worked during the weekend cleaning houses and working restaurants. In 2000, I became a nursing assistant working with the elderly and helping hospice patients in the last moments of their life. In 2000, for more than 20 years, I have worked with the community, helping the undocumented, fighting for human rights. 
My daughter-in-law, Gladys Revelo, she's the mother of my grandson, Gianni, and she qualified for DAPA, but because the Republicans have blocked DAPA, she, can have, she doesn't have no papers right now. Form 5 for immigrants who are the most at risk, undocumented, and low-wage worker people, like in my state of Virginia, who pay low-wage people who work, uh, like my state in Virginia, who pay billions in taxes and are not able to access beni uh, basis benefits like Social Security and tax credit. And despite all odds, there are many success stories, like a student, business owner, contributors to our local economy, and communities, a school, and economy. Senator Sanderson, my question is what would you do to ensure these communities continue not just to grow but to succeed? What would you make sure comprehensive immigration reform a passed with the citizenship is at the top of your agenda, sir? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your courage. And thank you for telling us your life story, which reflects the life story of millions of families in this country. Um, I think one of the saddest things that I have seen since I've been on the campaign trail is the fear that exists in many people that they can walk out on the street today and suddenly be deported. Mothers are worried about their children. Children are worried about their fathers. That is not what America should be about. So what we have got to do is to fight as hard as we can to end that fear that exists by taking people out of the shadows immediately, as quickly as possible, and providing legal status. All right, that's number one. And number two, obviously, your point about people contributing into Social Security not getting the benefits, you're absolutely right. And that is unacceptable. So what we have got to do, I mean, the goal is that we have 11 million people today who are living in fear. We have got to move as rapidly as we can to comprehensive immigration reform. We've got to rally the American people to demand that Congress does it. And we have got to have a president who will use the executive powers of that office to make do the best that he or she can. Senator, That's my, yeah. Senator Sanders, can I follow up sure. on Ivanya's question and ask you, uh, in January 2017, in the first 100 days of a Sanders administration, would you make a priority to fight and pass comprehensive immigration reform with a pathway to citizenship in those first 100 days? You want the short answer? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well done. All right, short answers, that's great for us. <laughs> Let's keep it moving. So we're gonna move to the topic, actually you just mentioned this, we're gonna move to the topic of executive authority and enforcement of our immigration laws and we have Gustavo Velasco from Nevada to ask you a question. Hi, my name is Gustavo Velasco. I am a DACA recipient and I cannot tell you how big of a difference this has made into my life. I am part of the group now that doesn't have to look over the shoulder when a cop or an immigration officer comes around. It's such a relief. I've been living, uh, I came to uh, America, or the US, when I was 14 years old with my mother Maria. Uh, we've been living in Nevada ever since. We came from Mexico, and I now call this home. My story is similar to the ones of many immigrant families that just want to come here to better their lives and their quality of life for the children, sisters, brothers, all of us as a community. I went to school and I got my associate degrees, degree in culinary arts, and now I, I co-host a uh, morning show called Wendy Arena, where I have my own cooking segment. I absolutely love it. At a young age, <laughs> at a young age, I learned the quality, the, the, family, the, the, the family values are very important to my mental health 
and my overall well-being. It just makes us more solid as people. Now, I had to separate from my, from my family that I have not seen in 16 years, along with my mom. I've seen my mom cry about it, but we hold it back because now we're kind of cold. The distance has put a burden on us. However, we do the best that we can to thrive every day. Me being a younger generation, I feel like I have adapted more to this country. I speak the language. I hang around among many races that teach me a lot. My mom hasn't. Like you mentioned recently, right now, a few minutes, there's a lot of people that live in the shadows that we got to bring out. My mom is one of them. Even though she's a dapper recipient, she cannot do it. Uh, my little sister is a U.S. citizen, so she qualifies because of that. So DAPA was put in the back burner, and I don't, think any I don't think that's the place for anybody's mom or anybody's family member. She's not as fortunate. DAPA is stuck in the courts, and we have fought hard for these policies to keep immigrant families together and are very extremely disappointed that these measures are being held up in the courts. My question to you, Senator Sanders, is if elected, you mentioned your executive power, how would you use the executive authority to make sure every tool at your disposal is used to keep families like mine and families like many others that are present here together? The other one is how will you deal with the aggressive enforcement leading to detaining incarcerating and deporting unprecedented number of immigrants. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think your second question really significantly touches on the first, and that is we will fight vigorously in the courts to overturn that uh, decision. Uh, we will use the power of executive orders as boldly as we can. But there is something else that we can. Uh, the president has authority, as you know, uh, over uh, a significant part of federal law enforcement. So if the decision is this country faces a number of serious uh, crime issues, criminal issues, your mother, I suspect, is not one of them. And that means that as we prioritize what law enforcement does going after your mom and millions of other moms should not be a major priority. There are other priorities that we should be establishing. So I think that that is using our power in terms of law enforcement to say, no, that is not something that our law enforcement people should be focusing on. There are other issues that we should. That would be my answer to your question. Last question, Senator, comes from Licilia Rodriguez Trillo. Si se puede. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy and grateful to be here today. My name is Priscilla Rodriguez Trillo. As um, I am 63 years old, and I'm currently facing deportation. I could be separated from my daughter, Sophia, and my two grandchildren, Liam and Victoria. I am originally from Venezuela. I have been living in this country for 13 years. But I don't want to talk to you about immigration reform. I want to talk to you about jobs. I live in Metro Detroit. I used to work for the Venezuelan government, and because I refused to be part of the corruption, I was forced to leave my country. I, even though I have an engineering college degree, I haven't been able to apply for a job in my professional field because my status make hard it for me to apply for an engineering job. You have no idea how many times I cried frustration, depression, and hopeless. I came from a working as a professional to taking any job that I could find to support my family. 
For quite some time, I was making four to five dollars an hour. I work at the airport cleaning bathroom, cleaning floor, in factories and the production line, as a maid, as a housekeeper, a cook, a babysitter, raising somebody else, some people's kids instead of mine. It was a painful choice to have to make. Every job I took has nothing to do with my degree. This is something that many people face in Michigan, not only undocumented immigrants. Low wages, unemployment rates are a huge problem in Michigan, especially in the city of Detroit. The majority of recent immigrants in America live in the lowest income communities. Communities like Baltimore, Baltimore, Detroit, and Flint. Places that have suffered from decades of lack of investment and discrimination. Now, Senator Sanders, my question to you is, Will you, Senator Sanders, commit a big enough investment need to reduce the unemployment rate at least 50% to the poorest places in America? Thank you so much. Priscilla, thanks very much for that important Question. Are we better off today economically than when George W. Bush left office? The answer is absolutely. Are we anywhere near where we have to be? No, we are not. Every month, the government publishes, and you see on the front pages of the papers, an unemployment statistic. Recently, it is 5%. How many people here really believe that unemployment in America is 5%? It ain't. It is virtually double that if you include people who are working part-time and people who have given up looking for work. Youth unemployment, as I mentioned a moment ago, off the charts. African-American youth unemployment and underemployment, 51%. I believe that when you have millions of people unemployed and underemployed, it is the responsibility of the federal government to create millions of jobs. And this is what we have proposed And this is what we have proposed, and it's interesting, you're an engineer. Yes, and this relates to this, all right? You all know that in America, our infrastructure, roads, bridges, water systems, wastewater plants, airports, rail system, falling further and further behind. We need to invest trillions of dollars. We have legislation, we invest $1 trillion, rebuilding our infrastructure over a five-year period creates 13 million decent paying jobs. How's that? All right, number two, youth unemployment. One of the scandals, one of the disgraces that our country faces is we have more people in jail than any other country. You all know that? And it is related to unemployment issues. So as I said a moment ago, this president will put money into education and jobs not jails and incarceration. And in fact, I have worked with Congressman John Conyers, I don't know if you know John, from Michigan, on a $5 billion youth employment program. In my view, to answer Priscilla's very good question, we have a desperate need to create millions of decent paying jobs in this country. And the truth is there is an enormous amount of work to be done. We need not to be firing teachers, we need to be hiring teachers. And Priscilla, when we deal with the tragic crisis of climate change and the need to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel 
and move toward energy efficiency and sustainable energy, we can create all types of jobs, creating a green, sustainable economy. So one of the concerns that I have had is we do not talk enough about the decline of the middle class, low wages, and the need to create millions of jobs. So on the same day that we talk about comprehensive immigration reform, we will also talk about a massive federal jobs program to put our people back to work at decent wages. Senator Sanders, I want to follow up with you on, on, on this question, because uh, you put out some great numbers. $1 trillion, yep. uh, $5 billion youth program. Yep. So I want to draw some contrast with uh, your, your rival candidates. Uh, Secretary Clinton recently proposed a new New Deal for targeted investments in high poverty communities around the country for job creation and infrastructure. Uh, yesterday, we all heard from Governor Martin O'Malley, who said he is going to announce this week a new agenda for American cities. Uh, I and many others have talked about $200 billion a year investment in targeted investments in cities, particularly for communities of color where African Americans and immigrants need the most help. So can you clarify for us that $1 trillion number, what, what will be the number? Uh, is that over a 10-year period? No, it's a five-year that, period. So five year, it's a so five-year period. He's with us, $200 billion a year, right? <laughs> we're going to go further than years. that. So say more, we're going to go further than that. Because Priscilla is right. There are communities, whether it is Baltimore or Detroit, where we desperately need to rebuild those local economies. Uh, and, and here's the point, which is an interesting point. We are spending $80 billion a year keeping people in jail. How's that? I can think of so many better ways to spend money rather than keeping people in jail. And when you take some of that money and you invest it in jobs and education, in hiring teachers and hiring mentors, you know what? We're going to save money by creating jobs. Yeah, it'll cost us some money to put people to work, but it is a lot less expensive to find a job than to put somebody in jail. All right? It costs a lot less money. So I believe in a full employment economy. I think that makes people, you know, you talked about fear. We talked about fear. I think, Gustavo, you, you talked about fear. Well, the same principle exists when some, I've been unemployed in my life. You don't feel very good if you're not a productive member of society, do you? You feel, am I worth anything? What am I worth? And then you get trouble. There was a study recently, people, middle class people, mortality rate is going up. Their wages are going down. They don't have any jobs. They, don't see any meaning in their lives. They're in despair. We can create an economy in which we rebuild our infrastructure, we transform our energy system, we have the best childcare system in the world, not a dysfunctional one, where all of our kids who have the ability and desire get a college education, and when you do all of that, you create many, many millions of jobs and you make the American people feel a lot better about themselves than many of us are feeling today. That is my goal. Thank you. Let me, let me, one more follow-up. Just one more quick, one more quick follow-up on this. Would you target yes. that $1 trillion into high poverty communities, Absolutely. communities of color, and knowing that race and racism is the historic, the problem in American politics, how would you convince white working class voters that this is actually in their interest as well to target resources to communities of color and immigrant communities? Because the, um, I start off with this premise, that in the last 30 years, I want everybody to know this, there has been a massive redistribution of wealth from the middle class and working class to the top one-tenth of one percent who have seen a double doubling of the percentage of wealth they own in America. So what we are going to do is not say, oh, we're just going to give money to African American or Latino communities. I'm not going to do that. We are going to focus on communities most in need. But I got news for you, in white rural states, there is also need. And I think in a country which is the wealthiest in the world, in a country which has seen a massive distribution of wealth 
from the poor to the rich. We are going to ask the wealthy, we are going to ask corporate America to start paying their fair share of taxes, so we're going to be able to put all people back to work, targeting, of course, those communities most in need. But it's not going to be exclusively. There are white rural areas where you have 20% unemployment in America, and I want to pay attention to them as well. We have the resources to do it, and that's what I intend to do. Thank you, Senator. And to close us out, it is my honor to introduce, the, uh, well, she needs no introduction in this movement, but I'm going to do it anyway, the ferocious, the gracious, the powerhouse that is, Angelica Salas from Chirla. How are we all feeling? Good. Well, um, we believe you, Senator Sanders. This election is about us. It is about our power. It is about what we're going to do to make sure that candidates listen to our families and respond to our families. And with me today is Berta Sandoval, who's going to tell us what she's going to do. Berta? Gracias. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias a todos. Mi nombre es Berta Sandoval. Emigre Soy nacida mexicana. Emigré, emigré a este gran país en los principios del 80, de los 80s. Aquí conocí a mi esposo, con el que ahora tengo cuatro hijos y dos maravillosos nietos. He participado activamente tocando puertas, llevando información a la comunidad latina para que salga a votar y se haga escuchar. Hoy más que nunca necesitamos salir a votar porque nunca había yo escuchado esta retórica racista que, muchos, que algunos candidatos han elegido para atraer el voto de los ciudadanos. Soy naturalizada americana y mis hijos son nacidos, mis hijos y mis nietos son nacidos americanos, pero ¿saben qué? Son latinos. Y si un racista gana la presidencia, tú y yo vamos a ser discriminados porque somos inmigrantes, porque vamos en el mismo barco, porque somos latinos. Así que tenemos que seguir trabajando duro para llevar información a los votantes y salgamos a votar y mostrar nuestra fuerza. Somos una gran fuerza latina. Y ellos tienen que escucharnos. Somos gente humana, cálida, amorosa, con grandes valores morales. Que nos importa que la familia esté unida. Y que solo vamos a votar por el candidato que se, com que se comprometa con nosotros para parar las deportaciones, para mantener a nuestras familias unidas y para que se comprometa a una reforma integral. Así que compañeros, sigamos luchando, que sí se puede, sí se puede, sí se puede. Thank you, thank you, Berta. So, she's a naturalized citizen, has a family, um, who is a, a beautiful family that's willing to go out there, knock on doors, and make sure that a candidate that is going to be the next president respects us. Not hates us, but respects us. And that's what we're, and she's making the call to make sure that everybody who is a Latino, who's an immigrant, does the same. Are we going to do the same in this room? Are we going to get activated? So I want to hear, this is about our power. If you're going to vote this election, stand up. If you have a family member who is a citizen and you're going to get them to vote, stand up. If you're going to knock on doors and get our friends and neighbors to get out and vote and have a voice, stand up. We're all standing. We're all standing because this election is about our families. This election is about the future. The racists, the bigots, they're the past. We're the future. We too are America. So I say, sí, claro que sí se puede. 
So I want to say, that's right. And we're voting, as, as Berta said, for no more deportations. No mas deportaciones, no more deportations. We conclude this forum by thanking Senator Sanders. Let's give him a big round of applause for being here. A big round of applause to our leaders for standing and representing our families. A round of applause to the Center for Ch Community Change Action and the nation for hosting this important forum. And to you, to every single one of you in this room that's gonna get out there in our communities and make sure that immigrants and their families are respected and are cared for. Y ni una más deportación. Thank you very much. Si se puede. Se puede. Se puede. Muchas gracias y el foro ha terminado. Muchas gracias.